highly experimental M52 was to be powered by the largest jet engine ever built. Frank Whittle, the designer, would create additional thrust by reheating the exhaust gases of the jet by injecting extra fuel. It was the first use of a technique now common in modern jet fighters. To demonstrate the huge power of the new engine, a The M52 never flew. In post-war Britain, it had proved too costly. It was suddenly, without warning, cancelled by the Ministry of Aircraft Production. Well before the cancellation, the Americans had asked to have some information on the M52. So all the design data was given to the Americans. The American Bell Aircraft Company, who'd received the plans, came up with the X-1 plane, also shaped like a bullet. Its role, in 1947, to break the sound barrier. The X-1, although remarkably like the British M-52, was powered by an oxygen alcohol fueled rocket motor. But, like the M-52, the X-1 had tiny wings to dissipate shock waves approaching the sound barrier. A daredevil young test pilot, Captain Charles Chuck Yeager, had been chosen to fly the dangerous oxygen fueled rocket plane. We were hamstrung because of the effects of the speed of sound on all of our airplanes. And the country that gets above the speed of sound learns how to, how to control the airplane, is the guy that's going to rule the skies. The X-1 was attached underneath a B-29 bomber and simply dropped from 25,000 feet. What we've been doing is each flight going out two tenths or four tenths of a Mach number, increasing the speed, looking at the data. On previous flights, Chuck Yeager found that the closer he got to the speed of sound, the greater became the shockwaves on the X-1. It became nearly impossible to fly the plane. Now we've got a big problem because we're losing our ability to control the airplane. The 14th of October 1947 was the 50th test flight of the X-1. October the 14th, just like any other flight, we didn't know we could get above Mach 1, but the mission was to try. Operating there around 9495 Mach number, and I'm sitting there in pretty heavy buffeting because of the shock wave that's forming on the nose of the airplane. And finally, at about 95 or 96 Mach number, suddenly my needle goes off the scale. When it does, all the buffeting smoothed out and kept it out there off the scale for about 20 seconds and the airplane flew very smooth. And uh, on the way down, I fool around doing rolls and things like that. The thing that went through my mind is that it really wasn't as hard as we thought it would be. It was a milestone that the whole world had been trying to accomplish. We did it with the X-1. And it gave us a quantum jump over the rest of the world in technology. The X-1 had been test flown and landed at the Mojave Desert in California. This vast, dried-up lake bed would now become the center for American experimental high-speed flight. Today, it's known as Edwards Air Force Base. Strange new experimental aircraft appeared over the Mojave Desert, designed to push speeds ever higher. Breaking the sound barrier safely meant enormous increases in speed were now possible. Chuck 
Jaeger became central to America's high-speed test program. For four years, the X-1 was the fastest plane on Earth. Then, with a new, larger, bullet-shaped rocket plane, the X-1A, Chuck Yeager began a series of new record attempts to push speeds over Mach 2. Then we came out with the X-1A in 53 and had the same wing, same engine, same tail, except we had about three times the amount of fuel in the airplane, so I worked it out to 2.5 Mach number and ran into a lot of problems because of the size of the tail and got into tumbling and stuff at 80,000 feet. No one knew if the X-1A would be safe at speeds in excess of a thousand miles an hour. When Chuck Yeager took it up to 80,000 feet and began diving to Mach 2.5, the X-1A went out of control. Jaeger fought to control the X-1A as it fell at 1,600 miles an hour. His voice was being recorded over the test flight communication system. I can tell it, I got real no bad trouble. We're down to 25, though. I don't know what to get back to the bench or not. How are you, though, old buddy? Correct. I think I can get back to the bench, though, please. I think I'm busting the cat in my head, though. Using all his piloting skills to point the nose upwards, Jaeger finally found a way of getting out of the spin. He'd been close to disaster. You're coming down. The more knowledge you have about your airplane, your system, the better your chances are of surviving when things start falling apart around you. I found that you don't want to react too quick to an emergency because a lot of times you do the wrong thing. The reason probably I'm uh, spent 55 years and one month in Air Force cockpits and still survive is because I made it a point to know everything I could about the airplane and the systems because that's what keeps you alive when you have an emergency. Unlike Chuck Yeager's X-1A, it's impossible to lose control or spin this jet plane. In 1979, the F-16 became the world's first aircraft to have an onboard computer that instantly rectifies any handling mistake a pilot might make at supersonic speeds. With 3,600 F-16s produced, this American machine is the world's most successful military fighter. The plane can hit speeds of Mach 1 and Mach 2, acting as either a fighter or a bomber. One of the homes of the F-16 is Hill Air Force Base in Utah. Following the September 11th terrorist attack, Hill's F-16s were responsible for protecting the whole of the western United States. Lieutenant Colonel Paul Strickland is one of Hill's operational commanders. After the World Trade Center was attacked by terrorists, our wing established a 24-hour alert of some of our F-16s. There were strict rules of engagement that were handed down in order for our pilots to intercept and to actually uh, fire on a civilian aircraft. And that still remains that way today. And the reason behind that would have been to save that many more lives on the ground. Every one of our pilots would face an inward moral dilemma. However, uh, that occurs in war. and That's what we're trained for. <laughs> Today, well after September 11th, there are always supersonic F-16s at Hill, waiting on the runway, ready to fly. A pilot's ready to go and the F-16's ready to go at any given notice. Just have to remember that noise is the sound of freedom. <laughs> 
Our objectives today are to kill and survive, 100% target destruction. As far as mission material, Lieutenant Colonel Glenn Reedy is leading a two-plane high-speed practice bombing mission today. Responsibilities, of course, as we go out there, is myself is going to be navigation and making the tactical decisions. Number one, numero uno, is to avoid the rocks. Today's modern pressure G-suit allows an F-16 pilot to take up to six times gravity when accelerating through the sound barrier and beyond. Flying as an observer in the second plane today is Cadet Annie Krieger from the U.S. Air Force Academy. Where are you from, Annie? Uh, Missouri. It's her first flight in an operational F-16. Once we got that scramble order, we can get airborne in about five minutes. The multi-role capability of the F-16 allows it to perform many different missions, hence the name multi-role. From takeoff to Mach 1, you're looking at 90 seconds. If it is a relatively clean airplane, it can go take off to Mach 1 in probably about a minute. On her first F-16 flight, cadet pilot Annie Krieger is already at Mach 1. It was really neat to just go for it and pull up and everything just goes really quickly. We got up to about six and a half Gs and so everything feels really heavy and it's really hard to move around. Then it was a low level dash at supersonic speed to the bombing target. Down low level through mountainous terrain, more time is spent focusing on what's out in front of you, and we term it as near rocks and far rocks. Once you're low, you can definitely see how everything going by quickly. When you're a lot higher, you don't realize just how fast you're going. You have a lot less margin for error when you're flying down low, so your senses are heightened doesn't take but a half a second of inattention, unfortunately, to hit the ground. The mission of the pair of F-16s today is a high-speed attack on a dummy target in the Utah desert. We climbed up and went to what we call Eagle Range, which is a basic surface attack range. There's targets on the ground and they have a capability with towers to triangulate to score our bombs. I could see the plane in front of us was bombing. I could see the target as it went by. And I could see the maneuvers that we were doing. As part of the attack mission, the two F-16s also practiced firing their cannons at a target. The F-16 is also a formidable air-to-air -air fighter. But when the plane is maneuvering and rolling at Mach 1, it needs a computer to fly in safety. This airplane would not fly without the computer. Computer design replaces a lot of the hydraulic lines in a conventional airplane, and that reduces the weight. The F-16 and any fighter uh, finds an advantage with supersonic flight. There's no doubt about it. So entering a fight probably just right around the Mach is probably the most advantageous speed for the F-16 to enter a tactical fight. Planes like the F-16 accelerate to Mach 1 and even Mach 2 using their afterburners. But they can't remain at these speeds for very long. Fuel consumption is too high. It's at a great cost of fuel because in order to maintain above the Mach, uh, generally you have to be an afterburner and that consumes a lot of gas. i doing this 16 years. It's been a dream. Every time I get in and get a beautiful day like today, you know, they allow me to take this airplane out. Uh, it's a great honor. There's a lot of work that goes into it, but uh, it is such a thrill that it makes it uh, well worthwhile. great time. I would like to be flying the F-16 one day. Definitely. This extraordinary plane was built for one purpose, spying. 
It's a Mach 3 2,000 mile an hour cruiser. Built in the late 50s, the secret SR-71 Blackbird is the fastest jet plane ever flown. Colonel Ken Collins was an SR-71 pilot in the 60s and 70s. The SR-71, the speed is 3.2 Mach and the altitude, operational altitude, is 85,000 feet. We couldn't tell our wife, our family, anything about the project. She knew that I was working on an aircraft program and that it was very classified and that's all she needed to know. I was working for the Central Intelligence Agency as a project pilot and my cover was uh, Hughes Aircraft Company. Ken Collins was running spying operations in the Blackbird over North Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And we would take off from Okinawa and we'd then accelerate out to 80, 85,000 feet, overfly North Vietnam, Haiphong and Hanoi, descend down near Bangkok refuel again and then climb back up and make another pass through North Vietnam and we were doing 3.2 Mach and 80-85 thousand feet. At these heights Blackbird was silently gathering intelligence. China area that holds part of the camera systems and he's out it's tapered and it is of titanium and a honeycomb plastic. This is the UHF antenna camera bays here. In the safety of our altitude and airspeed, we could get any operational photos of uh, bomb strikes, whether they're hitting missile sites or hitting bridges. Those photos are given on to the Air Force and to the Navy. The camera could see the fingernails on a man's hand on a clear day. With Blackbird 15 miles high, flying at a massive speed of nearly 2,500 miles an hour, it was near impossible for the Russian SAM missiles of the North Vietnamese to shoot down the plane. They would launch their SA-2 missiles. We could see more of their smoke and contrail coming up than we could see the missile itself. We'd just be flying at 85,000 feet and they never got to 85,000 feet. And then, of course, the speed of 3.2 Mach was uh, very instrumental in our the safety of the aircraft. During the late 50s and early 60s, the super-secret Blackbird was years ahead of its time. The Blackbird even had its own special fuel called JP-7. The ignition point was so high on it. You could put a match in the fuel and it would not ignite. The stealth technology was designed into the shape of the aircraft and it wasn't painted black just to be ominous. It was to absorb radar reflections. We had a speed record, New York to London, with one refueling, an hour and 50 minutes. Blackbird was so secret that when Ken Collins had an accident in the plane, he had to pretend he'd crashed another aircraft. We were doing subsonic engine testing, and I was only at 30,000 feet. But uh, the air data computer failed, and next thing I know, all the instruments started winding down, the altimeter, and the airspeed started decreasing. And uh, the last thing that uh, I saw was 102 knots on the airspeed indicator. It pitched up and went into a flat and sippet spin, which is uncontrollable and unrecoverable. Not knowing my altitude, I ejected. As I was floating down and watched the airplane crash off into the distance. I figured I'd be out there a while and had to survive. I was collecting all of my equipment, my parachute to sleep in. And I noticed a white pickup truck come bouncing across the desert. Three guys in the front. They had my canopy in the back of their truck. And they said, get in, we'll take you over to your airplane. And I says, no, you can't do that. I said, that's an F-105 and it has a nuclear weapon on board. They said, we're leaving. If you're going with us, you better get in. Ken Collins' ploy worked. It kept the farmers away from the spy plane. 
But in 1999, Blackbird, the world's only plane that could cruise at Mach 3, was retired. Blackbird's surveillance role was handed over to satellites in space. But America also had a piloted aircraft that, for short bursts, could go well in excess of Mach 3, the X-15 rocket plane. The speed records that the X-15 shattered in the 1960s still stand today, 40 years later. Californian State Senator Pete Knight, who flew the X-15 then, remains the world's fastest pilot. Every time I flew the X-15, I knew that there was going to be a record. It was going to be, you know, into what we call the unknown. The X-15, powered by an oxygen ammonia rocket motor, was built to flight hypersonic speeds in excess of Mach 4 or 5, over 3,800 miles an hour. We had the B-52 as a first stage, which would take us to 45,000 feet. We would launch from the B-52, and light the rocket engine, 45,000 feet, the rocket motor fired for 100 seconds and punched the X-15 towards the heavens. In the mid-60s, Pete Knight wasn't just looking for speed records. With additional fuel tanks, he was asked to take the X-15 to the edge of the Earth's atmosphere. At those heights, if you look down, you can see that the Earth is round. I could see from San Francisco Bay all the way down to the tip of Baja, California. From here it flew to heights of 60 miles. That's 10 times as high as a typical passenger jet and almost to the edge of the atmosphere. The X-15, operated by NASA, was picking up valuable data on how man and machines would operate in space. Data that one day would be used to build the Space Shuttle. At those altitudes, we knew that we were weightless. You could feel it when you move your arms out and around. Sometimes there would be some things float up in the cockpit. I've had a washer come up and dangle right around my face. In October 1967, Pete Knight was asked to take the X-15 to a world speed record. We were scheduled for a 6.5 Mach number on this flight. And uh, I shut down at 6.5. Unfortunately, I got to 6.7. Sixty six hundred and twenty feet per second about twice as fast as a high-speed bullet a little over a mile and a half a second <laughs> that's moving along that was as fast as a piloted plane has ever been flown but flying at these hypersonic speeds even for short periods was dangerous air friction at high speed caused the X-15 to heat up enormously we were going to exceed the limits on the airplane from a temperature standpoint, so we had to cover the airplane with what they call an ablative material to keep the airplane cool. Having gone to the edge of the atmosphere and beyond, it now had to be landed. This was done on the dried up lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base. The airplane without power is a glider. A glider has a lift to drag ratio of uh, maybe 35 or 40. The X-15 has a three, three and a half. So it, it glides almost straight down. But it is controllable and uh, we do make a pattern and we are able to land the airplane easy enough. We don't use a normal runway, we have to land on a lake bed because we don't have wheels on this airplane, we've got skids. Now we have a wheel and a nose gear, but uh, the main gear are skids. The X-15 rode on racing skids to save valuable space inside the vehicle. As a result of this flight, we burnt the tail severely. We burnt off uh, the ablative material and we got into the basic airplane structure. And it was like you took a blowtorch to the airplane and, and just cut away on both sides of it. Despite the high risk, during 199 flights in the 60s, the X-15 provided an enormous amount of vital data for NASA's future spaceflight program. Without these pioneering flights, the space shuttle would never have flown in the 80s. We provided the shuttle with data to support physiological unknowns for a pilot flying within and outside the atmosphere and under hypersonic conditions and under full pressure suit conditions. We provided the shuttle with heating equations that were validated uh, from flight test data. And that's a big input when you're 
talking about a space shuttle that is going to experience high temperatures for a long period of time. The X-15 was a forerunner of the space shuttle in the fact that we demonstrated that you could fly an airplane from space, make a re-entry, make an unpowered landing, and do it successfully and repeatable. Today, the X-15 aircraft still holds all the world speed records. X-15 proved those speeds could be achieved, but it could only sustain them for a matter of seconds. America has for years been trying to perfect a plane that could cruise for hours at hypersonic speeds, that is speeds in excess of Mach 4 or 5. So NASA hired the Blackbird spy plane from the Air Force and made it a testbed for a more powerful engine. Steve Ishmael was one of NASA's test pilots. NASA, which has been doing supersonic research for decades, didn't want to lose the supersonic capability. So part of it was just, let's hold on to the opportunity, because once it's gone, it's very, very difficult to recreate and very expensive. At that time, the United States was in a program, which was a large effort to build a hypersonic aircraft. And it was thought that having a Mach 3 test bed had to be useful. To be able to cruise at hypersonic speed is the holy grail of today's aviation research. Flying above Mach 4, 4 plus, is unquestionably one of the most difficult engineering problems that we are trying to tackle, and we've been attempting it for at least 25 years. The real issue above 4 plus is what is your propulsion system? Because that engine starts dropping off in thrust about Mach 4. Then, there is the problem of the fierce heat generated at high cruising speeds. At Mach 2, you can fly with aluminum. At Mach 3, the temperature is about 720 degrees Fahrenheit. And aluminum isn't solid at that, that temperature. So this airplane is made out of titanium, much more expensive material. Heat generated at hypersonic speeds also gives engineers a problem with an aircraft's fuel tanks. They expand. It's really just one big tube of fuel tanks. Now when you get up to Mach 3, the airplane is supposed to have expanded uh, 7 to 11 inches when, from where it's standing as you see it here. Blackbird's fuel tanks were designed to seal themselves as they heat up at Mach 3. But when the plane is on the ground, they cool down and fuel leaks. Some of the holes that they fix, they're things you can put your finger in, and that isn't going to close. <laughs> I don't imagine that the fuel leaks ever were closed. NASA's experiments were unsuccessful. They failed to conquer the vital barriers of temperature and power during sustained hypersonic flight. Blackbird remains the world's fastest non-rocket powered plane, but today the aircraft is grounded with no roll left. Quite enjoyable, it's, you know, and it's, and it's exotic. You know, I saw a full moon rise twice, you know, once over the Atlantic and once over the Sierras here, because the airplane goes three times as fast as the Earth rotating. <laughs> yeah. So, how has Concorde solved the twin problems of heat and shockwaves for its supersonic fare-paying customers? When Concorde goes supersonic, you're compressing the air in front of you. That compression of the air in front of you causes a shockwave. The effect of that compression of air is that the structure of the airplane is heated up. And the nose, the front of the nose, can reach a temperature of, of 127 degrees Celsius. When Concorde's all heated up, you can actually remove the trim up here above the pilot's seat and actually touch the bare metal of the hull of the aeroplane and you can... F it, it's very hot. You do not keep your finger there for any length of time, I can tell you. The passenger cabin would become quite intolerable with temperatures of 100 degrees Celsius. So the air conditioning system in Concorde is the fuel. You've got 95 tonnes of fuel in the wings. That fuel is relatively cool. And the heat actually goes into the fuel. The fuel is the heat sink for the aeroplane. So as the aeroplane flies from New York, London, gradually the fuel in the fuel tanks gets warmer, gets hotter. 
but how does Concorde cope with potentially destructive shockwaves hitting the aircraft at supersonic speeds? As you go from the speed of sound to twice the speed of sound, the shockwave building up on the nose it actually squeezes the lift back down the wing. And if you didn't do anything about it, you'd end up with a very unbalanced aeroplane. So we move the centre of gravity of the aeroplane back as well to keep the two together. And so on takeoff and climb, we move 12 tonnes of fuel to the back of the aeroplane. The British and French governments who'd sunk billions into developing Concorde were well ahead in this difficult and hugely expensive technology. The US was determined to catch up. As part of its high-speed commercial flight program, NASA and Boeing went to Russia. The Russians had a whole fleet of grounded Tu-144, supersonic airliners. The Tu-144 was a perfect testbed in the early 1990s for America to try to develop a successor to Concorde. Gordon Fullerton was NASA's test pilot for the experiment. T-144 was built as a competitor to the Concorde, and if they had overcome the problems, I'm sure they would have been out there flying the Atlantic. T-144 was available. The Russians had one that had very little flying time, were willing to re-engine it to allow it to do the kind of flights we wanted to do. The airplane, unlike the Concorde, has canard surfaces that pivot out to allow it to fly a slower speed on takeoff and landing. And when the nose is drooped and the canards are out, there's a lot of vibration and a lot of noise in the cockpit. Surprising amount. The first impression once in the air was that the control forces are very heavy. I'm told that Russians like to build. Even the fighters have very heavy stick forces. It certainly was the case with the 144. So it was a manly airplane. It took two hands to steer it around. That engine was the engine out of the Blackjack bomber, a huge engine that was retrofitted to allow us to get this flying laboratory in the air and up to speed. The Tu-144, also known as Konkordsky, had had a checkered career. Built to rival Concorde, it beat the British-French plane into the air by a few months. Unfortunately, before it went into service, it crashed in 1973 while at the Paris Air Show. The French had sent up a Mirage fighter to film Konkordsky. It got too close. And as the Russian pilot took evasive action, he overstressed the airframe. Nevertheless, Konkordsky briefly went into service in the Soviet Union, but made only 100 passenger flights before yet another crash. The Soviets found the plane too expensive to run, and it was due to be scrapped. But NASA and Boeing saw it as a ready-made testbed to study the viability of American commercial supersonic flight. They paid the Russians $100 million to use it. One of the more important experiments was the heat transfer characteristics on a large structure. So one wing was outfitted to precisely measure the way the structure heated up as it accelerated and cruised at supersonic speed. NASA found the problem was fuel consumption. Unlike Concorde, the Tu-144 had to keep its afterburners on to remain at Mach 2. We took off on the supersonic test mission with 80 tons of fuel. By the time we took off, climbed, accelerated to Mach 2, the fuel was down to half that, 40 tons. After nine years' research, NASA and Boeing concluded a next-generation supersonic Concorde would be too expensive. Well, the sad answer, there, there hasn't been the enabling breakthrough to allow you to take a large airplane and fly it supersonically efficiently. Even with the best of engines that we can produce now, it costs a real premium and fuel consumption to go fast. And until we get over that hurdle, I'm afraid we're stuck flying right up against the Mach limit, but not faster than it. The failure of the Russian tests has finally led to America abandoning its interest in commercial supersonic travel.